Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to the Boss Hijabipreneur podcast. This is episode 70 and I'm here with our brother um, Moses Suleiman. So he's really, it's Musa Suleiman, but Moses the comic. So you all probably know him as Moses the comic. I know I do. It was like when I see his name Musa Suleiman, I'm like Musa Suleiman, who be that, right? So nah, mashallah. So he is joining us for um, episode 70, how to use and thrive with your talent. And just to tee this episode up really quickly, and what made me invite you on, um, Musa, is um, when I saw you post um, the post about being at, um, you know, Haverford College and having um, your, um, you know, curriculum, your class um, at Haverford College. And it got me to thinking, it got me to thinking about you and what I see of you. So we're always laughing. We're always, you know, oh, this brother's funny and all that good kind of stuff. But there's some method to the madness. Oh, yeah. There's a method to the madness and, you know, and it's genius. I really, really, really want to tell you that, you know, watching you as your, I don't know whether you want to call me your big sister, your little sister, little in height, maybe big as in age. That's Come all right. On. Whatever one, Come I'll on. take it. Come on. Listen, okay. Either one, you know, it is my pleasure to watch you. It is my pleasure to, uh, you know, cheer you on um, as your sister, um, you know, in faith. And, you know, here on the Bossy Jabbypreneur podcast, we like to highlight, you know, uh, Muslims that are doing great things in business. And so although it's called the Bossy Jabbypreneur, we're all hijabis, right? If we're Muslims, we're I, all I didn't know if I needed to put my hijab on for this. I didn't know, <laughs> you know what I mean, situation you had going on. I got one in the tuck if you need me to bring it out. Listen, if you want to bring it out, you know, go ahead. My Listen, I was going to drape it over my chair. I'm not going to put it on. I'm not Tyler Perry or nothing, but I was going to drape it over the chair and let you know I got a couple of them. <laughs> Yeah, Allah. So, you know, yes, we're all hijabis around these parts, but um, I think that it's important sometimes for us as women, for us to hear the perspective of men, to see what they, the challenges that they're going through, because sometimes we like to say, oh, that's only happening to the women, or that's only mm -hmm. happening to, uh, you know, the brothers, but we have a lot of like uh, commonality. And so I wanted to bring you on for that, for that. So, assalamu alaikum, official welcome unto you, jazakallah khair for being here. Let me give us well, well, absolutely. I'm 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 ecstatic. I'm first I'm just like am I the first guy to be on this because I've been no I've been I didn't go to sleep last night because I was real excited about this. No, your crony, uh Yusuf Chroma, he was on. So Yusuf been on before me. That just took all the appeal out of it now, unfortunately. I only got about 10 more minutes left on it. No, I'm just kidding. I, you know, because I was excited to come to this. This is this is this is the rave. This is the talk of the town. Let you know right now, Queen. Let's uh, get these your flowers while you can I'm still smell them. That. Everything you're doing out here for the Muslim community, the Jabby community is so dynamic. It's so, you know, I've been for a long time, I've been waiting to to just to do something with them with you. We sell your books in the store. They're they're a hot commodity. Those books that literally we gave a, a sister came into the store yesterday. She called because she wanted a um an overgarment. And in the course of this conversation, come to find out, she's like, I want to take Shahada. You know, she's thinking I need to buy an overgarment that that's a part of the process for taking Shahada. So she wanted to come into the store. Long story short, took a Shahada and gave her an overgarment and we and provided her with one of your books. Allah you know, so Allah. alhamdulillah, I'm man. You got some more. I'm just yeah, kidding. yeah. We, we we definitely need to get some more, inshallah, because you know, just sometimes, and that's really been my focus is that sometimes we don't know how just our day to day, how we what we're doing in the world, the influence or motivation that it can have on someone else and the impact that it can have on someone else. And one of my favorite uh, quotes from Quran is that, uh, you know, is there any reward for good except good? You know, and as we're doing and and and, and trying to create content and just kind of in the world is like we're always you always should have that undertone of trying to do something positive, do something good, because it really can motivate someone else. So may Allah just continue to reward you and your platforms and what you're doing. Jazakallah khair wa yakum, um, you know, and me. Just tears, tears, tears. I'm genuinely I'm gonna send some books um out to you guys today just for instances like that. Just go here. You know, Jazakallah khair, that's beautiful. So again, you know, prompted, you know, based on this um class. So can you please tell us a little bit more for, for those who are not familiar, who is Moses the comic, who is Musa Suleiman? Give us, you know, an intro and then you know, tell us about this class. Mm. And for college. I'm truly, truly, truly interested in this. Show. Yeah, so the, the, the class, so, you know, Moses, I, I've been doing comedy for over 10 years now, probably 11, 12 years of what it got started. And I got my start in Philly. Listen, you know, Philadelphia is, this is the doggy dog town. If you can make it in Philly, you can make it anywhere. Y'all already know. Um, there was a place, the Laugh um, House, 
um, which was, you know, one of the premier places in the city for urban comedy. We got our start, uh, you know, 2010. There was a, there used to be a show there called Funny Money Wednesdays. OK, and uh, we signed up. There, there, there was me. I was motivated to start. There was a 25th a surprise 25th birthday party thrown for me. And one of the girls at the party uh, was a sister named Najwa, who, um, you know, may Allah be pleased with her father, uh, Brother Jamil, beautiful, beautiful soul. Um, and she told me she was going to do comedy. She was going down to like an open mic night in a couple of weeks. And I'm like, look, we had a pack that day that if I do it, you you can do it. Um, so we went together. Long story short, it was called Funny Money Wednesday. So the, the whole purpose of the show was if you was funny, they passed a bucket around throughout the show and you got paid by what people put in the bucket. So I made $60 that night. You couldn't tell me I wasn't Kevin Hart. Uh, about 59 of those was from my own mother and family. However, you, I still was feeling good about my performance. Um, but it just snowballed after that. You know, I actually wound up starting to, doing some shows with Kevin Hart and, you know, Cheryl Underwood and Tommy Davidson. I was like in mainstream suddenly is, you know, once you start moving towards what your passion is, your passion will start moving towards you. Um, but in the beginning, those first couple of years, they're trying to find my voice on stage. You know, I'm not going to lie. I was I was somewhere in between like Richard Pryor and Bill Cosby, like somewhere in between. I wasn't completely vulgar and filthy, but I wasn't clean either. Um, you know, so, yeah, around like 2015, you know, I just was so uncomfortable with the environments and stuff that I was in. And, you know, comedy is a, is a very you know late night industry and bars and grills and different places and debauchery. Um so in 2015, I had kind of taken a step back a little bit from it. And one of my mentors in the game, you know, shout out to Omar Regan, Preacher Moss. These are guys that were like, you know, groundbreaking pioneer for me to be able to see that you don't have to compromise your integrity for your success. You can create and carve a path for you and be an authentically true to who you are. So, you know, we started this thing, the Super Muslim Comedy Tour in 2015, Omar Regan and I, with an organization in the UK. And, uh, you know, a lot of American organizations, they, you know, they didn't want to touch a comedy in the Muslim community was kind of taboo, you know, early on. Um, but, you know, again, Preacher Moss, one of the, the, the pioneers, the groundbreakers of Muslim comedy, he pretty much I, I would argue that he may have single handedly invented, if not carved the lane for the entire industry. What a law made me funny in the early 2000s. That was, you know, so motivational, groundbreaking for us to see Muslims uh, occupy that space. You know, him, Azim Muhammad. Uh, Azhar Usman, uh, Mo Amr, I think Omar did some of those shows as well. I, I believe that first tour was like a million dollars. They were just going into mainstream comedy clubs and doing Muslim comedy. So seeing people that look like me, I'm like, this is it. So alhamdulillah, man, since then, um, the Super Muslim Comedy Tour, we started that in 2015. That first year, you know, we raised over 500,000 pounds for disaster relief efforts. Second year, 800,000 pounds. And since then, sold out over, uh, man, maybe over 250 shows worldwide, Australia, uh, uh, South Africa, all throughout the UK, uh, the USA. Um, and that really just springboarded me into doing, um, I started a brand called Unapologetically Muslim. And the whole concept behind Unapologetically Muslim was just, again, not having to apologize or make concession for um, who you are, you know, being authentically you. And any space that I'm going into, I always tell people, you're going to know I'm a Muslim. OK, it, whether it's the beard or my clothing or just my demeanor, how I carry myself, you know, you're always going to know that I'm a Muslim. And, and that's really just been as a black Muslim, um, a part of my journey as well, occupying that space of of black Islam as well. And, and us always having to, um, you know, having to prove not just our identity, but our spirituality and our religion in spaces. You know, I've been I've been traveling internationally, coming through customs where people even before they stamp my passport, the guy's like, how are you a Muslim? And he's like, where are you from? I'm like, I'm, I'm from the United States. He's like, where are you originally from? I said, Pennsylvania. He's like, where are you originally from? I'm like, Philadelphia. He's like, why well, are you a Muslim? You know, so that that kind of was a was a catalyst for me wanting to start the research of how were black Muslims exposed to Islam, you know, worldwide. And the contribution that black Muslims have made to the landscape, not just of Islam, but across the spectrum of media and film, politics, um, um, education. And that class, I had a partnership uh, last year with uh, the Hupford Center in Haverford College. We did, you know, in the pandemic, I had to I had to pivot into a virtual space, as a lot of you guys probably had to do as well. So the virtual space occupying was curating events, you know, for different organizations. And Haverford was one of those organizations. So we did a virtual event. And in the course of kind of researching and doing that, it springboarded into them wanting me to come on board to facilitate a class with uh, uh, my co-professor, prof uh, this professor, um, um, Goin Ting Ha, who is an Asian professor of religion, of Sufi. He's teaching Sufi poetry at, at Haverford. Haverford is really on the dynamic cutting edge of, 
of um, education and exposing children to, you know, a, a different set of, of concepts within history, you know, because history doesn't belong to us. We belong to it. Um, so I came on board to create this class. This this class is, you know, it's called from Malcolm X to Dave Chappelle, a history of Islam, um, humor and comedy um, in America. And what we're teaching the first half of the class is really going into the history of the black Muslim. How was black people exposed to Islam in West and North Africa? How did Islam make it to the shores of America and the new world during the transatlantic slave trade? And so I'm very passionate about this class has been dynamic. We're only about four classes in now, but you know, initially I only wanted 10 students. Now we up to like 20 kids because the word is spreading and these kids are really, and mind you, Haverford is only 2% minority. So majority of the kids in my class are, are Caucasian, Asian uh, American uh, children, and they're just very passionate about learning about uh, Black Islam. So. SubhanAllah, you know, mashallah, you said a whole mouthful, right? Like I got questions like ready to go. <laughs> But like you literally answered at least the questions that I had on um, mashallah. And I'm, you know, it, there's a, a quote that says, when you make room for God, God will make um, room for your gifts, something like that. I'm probably messing that up or whatever. But you you said yes to Allah and Allah was like, okay, I'm gonna say yes um, to you. And so one of my questions is actually about that whole unapologetically um, Muslim. So my questions always like play on like what the guest is already doing. And mm -hmm. so my my question was, have you always embraced being apologetically a um, Muslim? And then, you know, if not, so we know it's not because you, you just said that. How did you cultivate on that? And, and, and from this, what I would like for the audience to take away is if you're in a space where you're not being unapologetically yourself, not being unapologetically Muslim, how can you cultivate it, um, you know, based on what our brother um, Musa says? I, th I think cultivation for everybody is going to look different and it may be based on circumstances and experience. For me early on, it was really just trying to assimilate into the environments I was in, you know, a tour with Kevin Hart and different people, you know, you want the opportunities. So you want to be in those spaces. You want to occupy those spaces and try to stay as integral to your character as possible. So, you know, for me, when everybody got the, the, the plastic cups and they're drinking alcohol, I got the cranberry juice in mine and I'm, you know, just trying to trying to be down with the camaraderie. Um, and then it just got, it gets to a point where you just feel like this is just not me. You know, you don't want to be in now. You even though you may not be partaking in it, you don't even want to be in the environments of of the stuff. And 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 uh, Islam is so beautiful, man, because Allah he says that first of all, he's you know one of my favorite things that Allah um, Taala talks about is that he says verily with hardship comes ease, verily with difficulty comes ease. But a lot of times, like you got to pay attention to the words. He says verily with hardship comes ease. Verily with difficulties comes ease. So Allah is, is promising you not only that any difficulty or hardship that you go through, you're going to get ease, but he's also saying with that while you're going through the trials and tribulation, I'm going to be there with you as well. If you stay integral and you, and you know, you keep your, your Iman, your faith. Um, so in those spaces, it was really just me having to pray to Allah, just completely turn into Allah, like Allah, you know, making dua that create an opportunity for me to be, to be able to do what I love to do in an environment that's conducive to what I believe in and where I can feed my family. Um, and he did that. And, and, and that might've been just from aligning myself with the, with the people around me. You are the people around you and, and meeting Omar and, and having preacher Moss and seeing what they were doing. It's like, look, the, 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 the will don't need to be reinvented. There's a lane. It, it really is just having that trust and, and moving in that direction. Someone messaged me yesterday that they want to get into comedy and, you know, they're influenced and inspired by me and asking me for advice. And I'm like, you got to turn to a law, like keep doing what you're doing and, and, and creating content and everything. But you have to completely uh, uh, unequivocally put your trust in the law that he's the provisions come from him. You know, early on, I used to have this mentality that you know, I would lose out on opportunities that you would lose out on an opportunity if you didn't respond to the email in time or you weren't good enough in the audition. And there's no such thing as a lost opportunity or a missed opportunity. There's only such thing as it wasn't your opportunity because the law, it wasn't meant for you for whatever reason he kept it from you, but he may have something else for you that was meant for you. So I, I got out of that mentality that everything that is, that's meant for me, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to give it to me. And my belief as a, as a Muslim, unapologetically Muslim is that as a black Muslim, no matter what space that I'm going to go into, now that I know that the provision and the resource and the opportunity and, and the success comes from Allah, that me being in there with a kufi on or with a, a hoodie on, I'll be on an airplane with unapologetically Muslim hoodies on. No disrespect. I paid for my ticket just like y'all. So if, if that denies me in this space, I wasn't meant to be on that plane at that time. And 
my success, I think, is rooted deeply within that and all these opportunities. In my own friends and family, like, how are you a professor at a university now? I'm like, look, Allah did it. Okay, Allah signed on these checks. You understand? And speaking of Allah, I need a couple more dollars on the back end of that check. But Allah is just, he's been so merciful to me. Alhamdulillah, you know, alhamdulillah, ameen, right? So, you know, that speaks to the tawakkul, right? So that speaks to that, you know, just I am going to trust Allah no matter what. Mm -hmm. I'm going to trust him to do for me in whatever, um, you know, space that I, you know, that I put myself into. And and that's what I like, too. It's almost like you're you're being intentional. Not almost. You are. You're being intentional now about the spaces that you find yourself um, in, that you're, you know, put yourself um, in. And, you know, that, you know, um, is a game changer um, because that was um, the way that it was for me too. you know, moving out of corporate space, you have a six figure salary, you've got the house, you've got the car, the kids are good, you know, everything looks um, beautiful on the outside, but you have no fulfillment, um, you know, and you're not um, connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so, you know, now, you know, being intentional, I'm going to intentionally go to this space. I'm going to intentionally, uh, you know, do this. It changes the game. It changes the game for you. It changes the game for, um, you know, everyone. So I well, believe you, it's important. Go ahead. You, you also have to, my father, one of my father's quotes used to be innovation is rewarded, but execution is worshiped. And I'll say that again. Innovation is rewarded, but execution is worship. And what I, what that means is innovation is creativity, right? And it's not enough to be creative. When you think about Steve Jobs, he created the iPhone and these concepts in his garage, items that literally let revolutionize the world. And so the execution really is one of the most core components of success because execution is the only thing that separates those who are successful from those that could have been successful because you actually did it. So Allah is like, like tie your camel. The story of that is like, he's like, you know, as the prophet, so I tell him, you know, we about to go into this place. Should we tie our camels or should we trust that, that they'll be here? You know, Allah have them here when we come out. And he said, you put your trust in the law and then you tie your camel. We still have to do our part too. So you can make du'a, you can, you know, ask for the provision, but Allah is like, listen, I'm not, I'm, you might still have to do 20 applications. And that's not even if you want to be in our industry and be a mainstream, you could just be a nine to five and that's fine too. It's like, but you got to put in 30 applications to get one or two phone calls. You don't just make du'a for a job and then shut your computer off. So we got to do our part too. Absolutely. We talk a lot about the story of Hajar, um, alayhi salam, and we talk about how, you know, that's a wakul, you know, she's in the desert with this, um, you know, child and her having to um, not only put her trust in Allah and pray, she was so devout that Allah would have probably answered her prayer anyway, but mm -hmm. there was a lesson that we were supposed to learn from her. And it was exactly the lesson that you just talked about, Brother Musa. And that is that, okay, I, I prayed, but now I have to move my feet. And then mm -hmm. she started between Safa and Marwa. And today we make Hajj because oh. our sister Hajjah. Right? She moved them feet. And I, and I made Umar. I never made Hajj. I moved, I made Umar. So I'll let, let y'all know right now that sister has some strong feet because that walk is serious. Okay. I don't know if you can do it with them Dr. Show's inserts or not. They told me I had to do that thing barefoot. My joints was hurting. You understand? You, they make you earn that. Them blessings removed. They make you earn that. Listen, may Allah, you know, if we've already been for Umrah, or we've already been for Hajj, may Allah, you know, bless us to um, be able to go many times over um, in our lifetime. Ameen. Allahumma. Um, Ameen. So I believe on this uh, podcast, I talked about it a little bit earlier, that we should receive the male perspective as well. <laughs> And, you know, this uh, podcast is listened to by women um, in entrepreneurship all over the world. So, um, you know, what is your, do you feel it's important uh, to have uh, women in entrepreneurship? So in your field, uh, we have Yasmin al Hadi that I see a lot um, with you, and I'm sure there are other um, women. You can shed light on the other women that may be in your space um, as well. But is it, you know, do you feel that it's important um, for more uh, Mus Muslim women specifically um, to be in entrepreneurship? Oh, well, absolutely. Listen, one of the best women of Islam was, was Khadija, right alone, and, you know, and the Prophet Sallallahu said that this world is temporary conveniences and the best comfort in this world is a righteous woman. And I heard a term the other day that I that I didn't agree with. It was somewhere on Instagram where someone was using the term, um, you know, modern Muslimas, you know, the new modern Muslima that because, you know, you guys are independent and you're working this and the third. And I'm like, I didn't agree with it because I said, you know, don't call Muslim women who have career goals or high standards modern Muslims, because there's nothing modern about female empowerment in Islam. You know, Muslim women are given and have been given an extremely high status in Islam from when it was revealed. And we we learned that from, you know, when we're young and, and Khadijah and the prophet's wife, so I tell them that she was strong and beautiful and independent. And so much so she took care of 
um, an entire business on her own and, and rejected men who would even try to, to approach her because their standards weren't high enough. So, you know, she chose who she wanted to work with. She chose who she wanted to marry. He was younger than her. So my thing is like, if you think that Muslim women who make decisions for themselves or are following some sort of new modern version of Islam, you know, is false because throughout history, women have been um, encouraged and inspired um, to, to, in, in having that sort of reverence um, and respect within Islam. And Khadijah is just one of the best versions and examples of that for me because she just was a great teacher. I was reading something even recently where she taught the Prophet Sallallahu who he was. She was the one who elevated him in his esteem. When he had self-doubt about himself or about a situation, she she would say no, you know? And so by the time that he uh, uh, married Aisha, you know, he had no fear of strong women because there are a lot of men who fear, you know, strong women who want them to be kind of like wallflowers. And, 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 but we learn from our examples is that um, the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi is to elevate women. And so for me, I think it's important for women to occupy spaces in all different genres of, of industry, which is why within this class, one of the things that we're really passionate about is showing the contributions of black Muslims across the landscape. You know, you, you have the Iftahaj Muhammad's, you have, you know, the, the sister Halima's, you have, you know, shout out to even, you know, um, uh, 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 the misunderstoods and the sister Kilanas and the Ilhan Omars and you know all of these different people. I know I named a bunch of black people because just like Issa Rae, I'm rooting for everybody black. No disrespect, um, but I think that women need to occupy these spaces. You know, even even my wife, you know, Sharima, and, and creating the Uma Shop. The Uma Shop is, you know, the first curated Islamic department store that's completely curated for Muslims by Muslims and every single item that we sell in the Uma shop is from a hundred percent Muslim owned business. And I would, I would venture to say 80% probably of our vendors are black Muslim women, black Muslim women who are, or who, who have, um, you know, clothing companies who have sunglasses, who, who sell in hijabs, who make up and in different things. And so it's very important for not for women to just occupy those spaces, but for men who may be the gatekeepers of some of these spaces to allow women to not just like come through the door and and and, and have a seat at the table, but to help build them so they can have their own doors and their own tables. So I think it's very important. Brother, I was back here on mute, clapping <laughs> just like this. Actually, it was louder. So I'm glad y'all didn't um, see that. But you said what you what you said it is exactly why I bring brothers on this podcast. It is, you know, some of you are the gatekeepers, right? So we're not asking you to do for us. Right. We're not asking you for you to create the business, give us the plan, give us. We're not asking any of that. We're saying, hey, you're standing at the door. We just need to be able to get in the door. Once we get in there, we're going to show them what we've got. Khalas. And, you know, inshallah, Sharima will be on here um, next, Hello. inshallah. And I'm so glad that you brought her up because the Uma shop, I, I don't, I, I said this to her, I don't even think she understands the magnitude of what mm. she created. Mm. I don't think she even understands the magnitude of what she has created. And I lived in Philadelphia in that surrounding area for 16 years. I know where King of Prussia is. Mm -hmm. To have a store called the Uma shop in King of Prussia Mall. We right down the hall from Macy's, Pandora's. And one of the things that the store showed us too, as Muslims, and I'm not even going, I'm not even going to quantify it as just black Muslims. I think as Muslims sometimes, and maybe the caveat of black Muslims is that we just been conditioned maybe to always take the low hanging fruit, right? And so what happened when we, when she came up with the concept for the Uma shop, and I, and I tell people, this completely her vision. I'm a passenger on her bullet train in, in that regard. But um, when she went to the mall, originally her concept and vision was to do a, um, to have like a kiosk for a weekend for, 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 for Ramadan last month, because that's one of our, you know, big, of course, for Muslims, we always look for stuff in Ramadan for decorations and clothing for eat. Um, and she went there and she wanted to do a kiosk for a weekend. The mall actually came back to her and was like, look, we got a, a storefront that was just recently vacated for, it was, it was a pee in the pod. And would you be interested in having it for the entire month, you know, for every weekend in the month? And long story short, you know, we, we, we initially did it as a trial run, as a, as a, as a pop-up for 30 days. And how did he laugh at that 30 days, the reception, we're 20 minutes outside the city with over 300,000 Muslims. Philadelphia is little Mecca. You know, you really can't, where Muslims are so integrated into the fabric of the city from the higher executive level that you, you have to have that relationship with the Muslims. And, and, and the Simon group who owns King of Pressure Mall and several other malls, they're like, we've been wanting to work with the Muslim community, but no one's ever approached us about it about having a store. So that showed me is that we don't be, sometimes we don't even be thinking to ask on the higher level of like, we'll take the small low hanging fruit. It's like, I want the whole tree. 
Why, why, why I don't want a piece of the fruit? Let me plant my seeds and, and grow my own tree. So alhamdulillah, man, the Uma shop. And since then, I'll say my, you know, and I give her her credit because that store has been so, I know, so inspirational to a plethora of people who now there's other Muslim stores popping up in the, in the mall. So alhamdulillah, shout out to a uh, uh, brother Muhammad and Gene Tricks. They have a store in there now. There's, there's other, and we have a prayer room in the store that we, this thing is, it don't matter who you are. We don't have to go into Nordstrom's and, and use your, your, your dressing rooms or go out to the car and use your dressing rooms. We got a prayer room in the store that when you're shopping or if you're just working, so people come make a lot in the store. They not even, they don't even need to shop. They just come in and pray. And so no and, and the people who respect that the most that you don't realize that's the non-Muslim. Then when the non-Muslim come into our store and they see their prayer room, even when we open the store and, the, and these executive billionaire millionaire um, men walked in through the store that owned the mall, the thing that they were most impressed about was their prayer room and being and, and the respect that we give to our religion. Goes back to that unapologetically Muslim. Brother, you got me like ready to go do stuff. You got to be ready to, okay, what initiative can we, uh, you know, do next? So for those of you that are watching, you know, live, please make sure that you go visit the Uma shop. They're also available online. So they have a website as well, yeah. www.theumashop. So make sure you, you go and check that out. Also, go check out the store. Um, make it your business. If you are in, you know, the Philadelphia area or outside lying area, so King of Prussia, like he said, is a little bit outside of the city. Make sure that you um, go and visit. It is literally- And if you have a business. I always say we're looking for product. You know, we're we're the 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 the, the easiest pitch that I tell people the Uma shop is like Angie's list for Muslim owned businesses. You know, we we are kind of a you know her vision is the, the Uma, the community, you know, of 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 people that have businesses. If you're a Muslim owned business out there, male or female, and you need your stuff, you know, to be highlighted on on that level to be we're the second biggest mall in america soon to be first biggest um then you know please hit us up because we're always looking for new content and 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 look we, we got the sisters books in there and they're hot commodity okay alhamdulillah alhamdulillah and jazakallah khair for that um you know opportunity you know um and shereen she said love y'all listen sis i love you back you don't got no choice but me i have no I choice i'm locked in, I'm locked in. Mashallah, you got no choice, my brother. We love you, love you, love you. Um, back, um, my sister. Um, and you know, speaking of the two, so um, this, you know, what you, you know, what Sharima is doing, what you're, what you're doing, they go hand in hand. And you know, I really want to go back for just a tick to the course itself and talk mm -hmm. about, um, you know, mainstream. Because this is about, so the name of this uh, episode is how to use and thrive with your talent, right? Mm -hmm. So this is you, like you said, you started off, you know, I've got to assimilate and be like, you know, these people over here that is the furthest thing against, or, you know, uh, uh, to what I am. And then you pivoted and you became unapolog unapologetically yourself. Um, Sharima with the Uma shop being unapologetically herself, scared. I know she was scared. Oh, I yeah. talked to her. Still scared. Like, was still Listen, we're we're behind you, um, my sister. All it is is a phone call or a text or a DM away. I need this, and mm -hmm. line, you know, there oh, we'll come behind you. But going back to you know the 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 course that you have, um, you know, you're teaching, like you said, people that are not even from the same race as you, and you're teaching them the basics, and then bringing them, you know, forward. And you talked about, you know, knowing our history. It's important to know our history. So with all of that. Um, in mind, you know, do you feel like that has shaped you as a comic? Do you feel like that has shaped you, um, you know, as a Muslim? And where do you go from here? So what's next? Mm -hmm. What's so next? The, what the, what's great about the class and just the whole concept of being unapologetically Muslim is being able to keep the core components of the class still rooted in what my identity is, which is as a comedian. You know, even though that we're doing this history of, of black Muslims in these different spaces, 30% um, of their grade, uh, you know, I got to put some comedy in there. 30% of their grade is a performance piece. So not only do the first half is them learning about the history of black Muslims, but also then going into um the core component of us within media, within entertainment. And so they have to, uh, we, we have workshops coming in. We have, we have Amir Suleiman, we have uh, um, Bashir Jones, we have Imam Jamil's son, Kyrie, he's coming in doing a workshop. We have Omar Regan, a Preacher Moss, they're coming in to do writer's workshops with the kids because they have to do uh, a core 
uh, performance at the end of the curriculum to do some sort of stand-up comedy. It can I be saw a that. It's a production. a production. A production, a production. And so what we're doing, and this is the first, this has not been even broadcast anywhere, but uh, we did a partnership uh, through my company and through the school with World Cafe Live, one of the premier venues in the city, Hamdulillah, and they gave us the space and we're going to be doing a, um, a big production there, March 24th. Uh, which is a Thursday night. And I hope people come out. We're doing this uh, again. There's only, and this goes into just showing you the dynamics of just being a black Muslim entertainer, that identity within multiple different genres. But even in my genre of comedy, there's only four black international Muslim comedians. There are only four black international Muslim comedians doing it on that level domestically and internationally is myself, Preacher Moss, Omar Regan, and Azim Muhammad. So now the four of us, we're, we're, we're getting together and we're doing this, this, this black Muslim Kings of comedy show, you know, for the city of Philadelphia, which is a huge um, black Muslim populated city. And we have our sisters, our Queens are coming on here as well. Inshallah, hopefully Nadira P is going to be there. Uh, Chanel Renee. Um, and so really just to kind of show, you know, our black Queens as well within comedy. And so for me, it was important to keep that component even in the class because comedy is one of the main the best really, in my opinion, vehicles to have these uncomfortable conversations around bigotry, around Islamophobia and around racism, because comedy is that um, it really drops people's gu guards and barriers. Because think about how innovative a comedian has to be for what they're talking about. When you go to a concert and you hear music, and that's the second biggest thing I would think, you know, as far as uh, the dissemination of communication is that when you go to hear music, you actually pay for that artist to do the same songs. You want to hear the same, uh, your, your, the greatest hits from Frankie Beverly or Beyonce or Jay-Z. But when a comedian does, uh, you know, this, the, the art of like spoken word and, and communication, it's a one-way conversation with your audience. Once you do that material, you talk about that content, they don't want to hear that again. You may be known by that joke where they say that's the comedian that tells that joke. But we constantly have to create and be innovative. And, and it's nothing like being on stage in that regard. And so the comedians that were able to carve lanes within the structure of social dynamic social justice like the dick gregory's you know like the uh the paul mooney's you know and and talk and like the like the the flip wilson's and the and the red foxes that were taught that what their comedy was centered around a time of social injustice of cultural disenfranchisement and having to center what they talked about around that and so the com the power of the comedian and the microphone is to use humor in a way to give dawa to give information about Islam. It's like, listen, by the end of this class, no disrespect, by signing up for the class, they got to take their shahada. Just throw that out there. They don't know that. That's another 3% of the grade because three is the sunnah. So by the end of the course, they don't know, but they got to take their shahada. And then, listen, we giving them hijabs. So anybody want to donate some hijabs and some thicker beads and everything, please let me know. Uh, I'm just kidding. Um, but yeah, it was so important for me to keep that component in the class, inshallah. Mashallah. And you know, I wrote that down. I wrote down two of the weeks that uh, you're going to cover, the topics you're going to cover. One of them was comedy as truth and then American religion. It was like, mm. those were the two weeks I was like, oh, I would take this, um, you know, uh, class. I'm not interested in becoming a comedian, but I would take this class for, um, you know, the information. And Dave Chappelle is one of my favorite comedians. Mm -hmm. um, and it's because he brings that, you know, Islamic, uh, you know, thinking. Right. So, you know, he always says I'm not the best Muslim, but he may not be the best Muslim, as he says, but it comes out um, in his um, comedy. What's it, great it, about Dave Chappelle that I respect so much. And we talked in my class yesterday. We were going into the history of the nation of Islam, because no matter what, you can't deny the contributions from these different uh, cultural organizations and movements and social dynamic organizations. We, we even we even went over stuff with Noble Dry Lee and the Moorish Science Temple. Like the, the, when, when you can extrapolate the good things that came out of these movements for black culture, you have to highlight that stuff. And uh, uh, what I respect about Dave Chappelle so much is that he, he lets it be known that I'm a Muslim, but I don't wear my religion on my sleeve because of my lifestyle. Because of the flaws that I have, he doesn't want them associated with his, with Islam. That's why one of the caveats whenever I say there's only four international black Muslim comedians and they say, well, what about Dave Chappelle? Dave Chappelle doesn't operate in this space where he where he is, you know, completely being represent uh, representative of Islam. And when I go in places again, because I'm it's going to be known I'm a Muslim and I'm leading with that. And that's not to say that that's any uh, derogatory anything towards that, that both spaces need an identity. And what I respect about people like um, uh, Russell Peters is that, and that's what my goal is. My goal is to bring mainstream into Islam. You know, what, what Russell Peters has done, he's brought mainstream into his culture and religion of his Indian culture, where when he's on stage at the Madison Square Garden or whatever, you're going to hear about his culture and his religion. 
And so no matter the same set that I'll, I'll do at a care banquet, I'll do at the Laugh House or at the Punchline Comedy Club. You're going to hear all about Islam. You're going to hear about this inshallah, mashallah, bismillah. You're going to hear, I'm going to bring you into that space and I'm going to do it in a way that's palatable for you. Um, but I think that this, again, this class is, and, and going back to the uh, Muhammad Ali, when we talked about Muhammad Ali yesterday, having people who represent a mainstream landscape of Muhammad Ali, quite arguably, I told my students yesterday, is probably the most famous person of the 20th century. There's not a rock. Studies have been done on this. They've done polls through the Pew Research Center of the most famous person of the 20th century. And the poll has come up and they, and they poll people worldwide. And they talked about Muhammad Ali, a black Muslim. And so you cannot ignore the contribution of black people as a whole to the landscape of, of Islam. And my goal, again, as a black Muslim entertainer, um, one of the weeks of the course we're going to, I think next week is, is this concept of triple consciousness. That was one of the terms that was, um, coined in my, in my estimation by Bashir Jones, which is why I have him coming to talk a dynamic speaker, dynamic artist, um, is this, uh, this, this idea of a, of a triple consciousness that we have as black Muslim men, you know, or black Muslim women, you know, we have to identify the fact that like, you are a black woman where the most disrespected person on the totem pole is a black woman. Now you're a Muslim woman as well. And then the black man, you know, so we, we, we already operate in, in our daily existence with a double and triple consciousness that most people don't understand the different la complexities of those layers. And, and I'm going to highlight that in this class. I love that, mashallah. I saw that too. And I saw Bashir Jones um, on there, um, you know, as well. I knew his mother. Really? Um, I'll be pleased with her. When yeah. I was little, when we were little, she was friends with my mother, subhanAllah. And she, for, for what he, he gives so much reverence to his mother for the man that he is. So, and I've never met her, but I just, I send uh, blessings up to her because she must have been a dynamic woman because he's a dynamic individual. She really was. And I, and this is small. I'm telling you, I was like seven to eight. Mm. You know, but mashallah, I'm just beautiful, beautiful um sister. Um, You know, may Allah be pleased with her. I mean, um, and, you know, so, Going back to what you, um, you know, just said is that, you know, um, I love what you said, where you're going to bring the mainstream into Islam. And the reason why that's important is because we, so, we spend so much time diminishing ourselves as Muslims, as women of color, whatever the case may be, it, even as covered women. So I represent, you know, the, the Muslim women that cover, right? So my representation looks a little bit differently than someone who may not um, cover. That's another, you know, layer that comes with it and a responsibility you know, on my part that comes with it, but then, you know, what other people, you know, kind of put on me, uh, you know, mm. or put on women um, who cover. And so, you know, it's, I, I think it's important for us to show up, you know, it's important for you to be unapologetically um, who you are. You know, you had to take that step back for you to understand that if Musa does not show up unapologetically as the Muslim that he is, what happens to the generations um, behind him? What happens to your children? And and that's why and it's so important that you occupy that space. And I was talking with my wife about this and other Muslim sisters is that I recognize as a man, as a Muslim man, that certain conversations are to really be filled and had by women. Right. That we can have empathy for certain, uh, uh, you know, uh, plights and struggles that they go through. But the, but the conversation of, of hijab really is a Muslim woman's journey and conversation to have because men can be very judgmental in that space and that, but I do understand it's not our journey, right? Um, so the space that you occupy is so important because what I see firsthand from hijabis in the influencer community is that a lot of times the pressure is to come out of hijab. And I've, I've been faced with opportunities where, you know, I've been to, to shave my beard, different things just as a man. Um, so for women, I know Muslim women influencers, comedians, actresses, everything that have been put in situations where the opportunity was directly correlated to their spirituality. Take that hijab off. That's the mainstream loves that. They love to sell us and they love to show the Muslim woman as being anytime you see a Muslim woman represented within a mainstream culture, she doesn't have hijab on. Anytime you see a Muslim man represented in a mainstream culture, he's a terrorist or something. You never see black Muslim men represented. You never see black Muslim women or hijabi women represented unless they're weak. Right. And so to, it has to be important for people like you to occupy those spaces for the women behind you who are struggling with that and see, OK, well, if this sister is doing it, then I can. Because I know sisters who take it off. And then when I read the comments, I see that other sisters that have been on the fence about it. Oh, well, she's doing it so I can do it, too. You don't know how you're the swing vote. 
just how you, just your your character, your your just the way you're you're living. Everything you're doing may be the swing boat for that person to say, okay, like should I do it? Should I not do it? But this person that I'm motivated by, that I see, shout out to the village auntie and and sisters like that that are man, what what y'all are doing? Y'all just don't realize y'all are just like the groundbreakers and and y'all motivate so many different young sisters behind you that for me to just as an observer i can't be a part of the conversation but as an observer i'm like man I'm, I'm glad that these sisters exist because i know a lot of sisters who struggle and subhanallah from a religious perspective think about what you're what you're leading someone to mm. so imagine you're covered in hijab and you're doing all of the right things and you lead someone to like you said take their shahada um like you talked about in your store or you lead someone to you know move uh you know closer to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alhamdulillah may allah grant you jannah but then imagine if you're the one that leads them astray mm. i don't want no parts Mm. Um, parts. And so we have to really, like you, we were talking about intention, really be intentional about the things that we say and the things that we do, because it could send somebody over. So I'm going to find this quote that I want to read to your sure. audience from um, the That's podcast. literally the next question. So is yeah. there a quote that governs your life or that you find important? Well, this is this is a quote that I read to my students and it talks about, and we know in Islam, one of the one of the biggest cruxes of Islam that we supposed to rely on is our intentions. The law says that on the day of judgment that, you know, you'll be judged for your actions, but your intentions may tip your scale. That law so merciful that he'll say, OK, you did this much intangible, actionable things, but you might be on the fence. So then he'll go judge your intentions. I intended to do a good thing, but maybe got sidetracked. He'll still give you the credit for it. So intention is very big in, in Islam. Right. So what's our what's the intention? It's our aim or our purpose. That you would so, and I'm gonna read this quote, and it'll give you a little bit more context. And this is from Ali Radiallahu Anhu. He said, "A drop of rain can fall into the mouth of a seashell, or the mouth of a snake, but in a seashell it turns into a pearl, and a snake it turns into poison." So, knowledge or religion given to a population of mankind can, in the wrong or right hands, become a reward or a toxin. And so. That quote is so powerful to me because, again, when you look at Islam and the, and the responsibility that we have as having these platforms, because you have a platform, no matter how many people follow your platform, you have a platform. I understand I have one as well. There is an intrinsic responsibility that we have with the intention of our platforms for how we facilitate content, how we give content to people, you know, how are we presenting ourselves as Muslims that we occupy this space and we're going to wear these hats. And this is why I say the responsibility really is so large in the in the Muslim woman community because you guys are the visual representations of Islam. Muslim women are the visual representations of Islam. You can look at a Muslim man and even beards now might just be associated. Beards are in. Beard gang, Philly beard, wherever. Just having a beard is not a thing of being Muslim anymore. Um, but when you look at a, a woman, you know, oh, she's a Muslim. You know, from how she may carry herself, how, you know, her modesty, how she's dressed. So because you're the visual representations of Islam, you have to be very intentional with how you're portraying things that, you know, well, I, I'm out of it on Thursday night and I'm posting all types of craziness. But then Friday is Juma day. So I'm going to be in my thobe and my evil garment. Then on Saturday, I'm in the club. I'm drinking and stinking just at a third. And I've had non-Muslims ask people, oh, I, I didn't even know Muslims could do that. Can Muslims do this? So we, we have to be very intentional for how, like, like Ali said, that we're the drop of rain. So the drop of rain, depending on where it's falling, could have uh, an adverse effect or not. So I'm I'm very intentional for, and do I make mistakes? Absolutely, absolutely, I'm, 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 I'm human. Um, but I, I, I'm very intentional in the spaces that I go into how I utilize my platform for people to know that uh, I'm a Muslim, I'm a black man first, I'm a father, a husband, you know, comedian, business owner, I'm a professor now, put some respect on my name. Um, but uh, that I try to be very intentional with um, my Islam. I'm very intentional with my Islam and, and how I portray, how I represent um, this beautiful religion. Alhamdulillah, you know, may Allah grant you tawfiq and may Allah keep you steadfast on the path. Um, I pray that for you and I pray that for everyone that is listening, that everyone that everyone that is uh, watching, um, inshallah. Mm -hmm. Now, so Jazakallah Khair for um, being here and being on. I've taken up enough of your time, Brother Musa. I so appreciate you. I try to take cl close to that 45 minutes. I'll play. 
No games, okay? Listen, listen, listen. And I want to thank you again for uh, um, the the ad you did for us on in our shirts. You know, that was it was just such a, a big blessing. You know, for us, may Allah reward you for for that as well, and just continuing to. Uh, create opportunities, man, for us to be able to have these conversations and and to have these platforms. Everybody out there, again, if you want to support uh, uh, the class, I'm actually going to, after the class is done, I've been getting a lot of requests. I'm going to springboard the class into, uh, I'm going to do another uh, workshop for people who really want the information of, of Black Muslims in the history. So I am going to do uh, a workshop on that as well. The show is going to be March 24th. That'll be all on my social media under Moses the Comic. I'll support. This is going to be really an important um, show. I really would, I need the community to come out and support this. It's, it's 300 seats in there. I want to sell it out. So I just hope people can come out in the city of Philadelphia, surrounding areas to support this class and in, um, in this show. And uh, But the, thank you for having me. Alhamdulillah, Afwan. Um, make sure you send me um, the link for where they can purchase tickets. And, okay. uh, you know, I'll send it to the community. I can put it in my email. I have an email list and we'll send that out so we can fill all 300 of those seats. You know, I did the play, so I know how that is. So 300 seats, it seems like a little, but. But it's a lot. It's when you got problem. 20 people in there and it's, and it's, and it's uh, you know, 280 seats or whatever, it's a problem. Okay. So I need the people to come. And, you know, a lot of times, especially in the black community, we wait till the last minute to be like, look, wait, when was it? It was two days ago. That's so, so we need y'all We need y'all to come ahead of time. Okay. We come need on. to, we need to stop trying to buy tickets at the door. Get your tickets ahead of time so we can plan accordingly. You know what I mean? We might change the venue because we don't have enough tickets. Y'all gotta, y'all gotta understand how this works. Come on. Okay. May Allah grant you Tawfiq every seat um full. May there be more shows um because you did, guys did an excellent um job. I mean, I mean, I mean. So without further ado, Jazakallah Khair again, uh, brother um, Musa for being on. My inspirational quote of the week: A smile is a cure. Perhaps. Allah the Almighty says in his ever glorious Quran, what, what means? Until when they came upon the valley of the ants, an ant said, O oh, ants, enter your dwellings that you not be crushed by Suleiman and his soldiers while they perceive not. So Suleiman smiled and amused at her speech and said, My Lord, enable me to be grateful for your favor which you have bestowed upon me and upon my parents and to do righteousness of which you approve and admit me by your mercy into the ranks of your righteous servants. Surah and Namal the Ant, verses 18 through 19. Amin. From this, we learn how great a smile is when it comes from someone strong and is offered to someone weak, or when an older person smiles at someone young, and how powerful is that smile when it's offered to from the ruler to the ruled? How amazing is a smile when it comes in the time of calamity, crisis, or panicking? That was the smile of Prophet Suleiman alayhi salam. His smile was filled with tenderness, passion, and admiration of what the little ant said and did. It was a smile that alleviated the tension of the situation. It restored safety, security, tranquility, and peacefulness to everyone. And Brother Musa, I believe that is the work you are doing. May Allah increase you and the badaka for you within it. Ameen. 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 Alhamdulillah. Thank you. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair for being here. And for all of you out there, please tune in next week for episode 71, How to Choose Faith Over Fear. Mm. Peace. Assalamu alaikum. Like, um...